How are you guys doing? Good, good. Uh, tired? I am too. Uh, probably not as tired as Sam, but I am tired as well. Uh, so here's what uh, I'd like to say really quick. Uh, just out of the gate, um, I love coming here. Uh, I, I really, really do. I, I, I am so proud of what you guys have done, are doing, have yet to do. I'm extremely uh, blessed to know Sam and to share a relationship with him, a friendship with him, especially uh, a church that he has helped build uh, in and through what God has put on his heart. And I just, I love, love, love what I see out here. I really do. I'm encouraged by Loft. Um, I know Crossway, uh, the church that I attend, is something that we want to strive to do, is something similar to what you guys are doing here. And so you guys are an encouragement to us. And so I just want you to know that we, uh, we really look up to you guys and to Sam as a pastor here. You guys are extremely blessed. There are times when my wife and I will get onto y'all's videos and watch Sam uh, preach online. And so it, every time we've listened to him preach, it's, it's always been a blessing to us. So I know it is a, a huge encouragement for you guys to have a pastor like Sam here. Uh, so here's what I'd like to do. Uh, just because I get nervous every time I do come here. Um, I, I'd like to be able to pray uh, for myself. If you could be praying for me and that just my nerves would just be still and God would start to take over, okay? Let's just pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you, Father God, for this opportunity for, for me to be here uh, and to, with your people. And so, Father God, I thank you for each and every individual that is here. I thank you for their heart for you, and I thank you for the ability to worship you. And so, Father God, I pray, just as Sam has said, um, if there are anything that I may say, any things that I may say here today that is not of you, Father God, I pray that those words would just evaporate and that the words that are from you and through you, I pray that those words would be heard and that those words would uh, cause conviction and change of heart and to press and draw into you. So we ask all these things in your son's name, Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay, so um, how many married folks do we have here? All right. All right, good, good. So I am married. Uh, I will be celebrating 15 years uh, in next April. Yeah, thank you. I like this crowd right here. Good crowd right here. Um, 15 years uh, will be coming up next April. Uh, and I remember, and I got married late, I mean late, in our culture it's late, um, early 30s, right? Early 30s is when I got married. Um, and um, I remember my dad sitting me down because I was going from one relationship to another relationship to another relationship, and my dad sat me down. He's like, boy, we got to talk. And so he sat me down one day, and he said, you, what are you looking for in a girl? And I was like, I don't know. <laughs> I have no idea. And he goes, that's probably why you're going from one relationship to another relationship to another relationship. So he said, so let me help you out, Okay. And so I said, wait, I don't know if I want advice from you. You're my father. And you're from India, so you don't really get the culture here. And he's like, yeah, but you may need some advice. Uh, and I said, okay, fine. So he said, hey, look, there's a, a way to find a mate. And I said, there's a way to find a mate. Okay, you're going to tell me something from the Bible. Okay, cool. And he's like, no, it's something that we, my dad passed on to me and his dad and his dad. And I said, okay, what is it? He goes, it's the A, B, C, D, E, F of finding a mate. And I was like, okay, this sounds really weird, but I'll go along with you, okay? And so he goes, A. Okay, I'm going to throw in the Indian accent just to kind of really let you see <laughs> what it was like for me, okay? A. A is for age, okay? You have to look for her age. You cannot go older. You cannot go too young. It has to be the right age. And I was like... Okay, that makes sense, sure. And then he goes, B. B is beauty. You have to make sure she's beautiful to you. Okay, if she's beautiful to you, then you will both be happy together in physical. <laughs> and I was like, okay, Dad, this is getting a little weird. I think I know where this is going. I don't want to do this anymore. Can we just stop here at B? Because I don't know what C and D and E and F is going to be like, right? And he goes, no, sit. We're not finished. And my mom's sitting here going, Mone, please. Just listen to him. Just listen. And I said, all right, fine. And he goes, C. C is character. Look for her character. Character is very important. I said, okay, that makes sense. And then he goes, D. 
D is dedication. Is she dedicated to God? And will she be dedicated to you? But is she mostly dedicated to God? I said, okay. I knew there was going to be a Bible thing in here somewhere, and I, there it is right there, right? And, she, and then he said, E, E is education. She has to be smart, and it looks like she's going to have to be smarter than you <laughs> because you're not very smart. <laughs> and I was like, all right, this is not going well. And then he, last one was F. He said, F is for family. She has to come from a good family, and this family important to her, Okay. So my dad went through that, through that whole spiel, right? The A, B, C, D, and F. And I was like, okay, that kind of makes sense. Uh, okay, cool. Now this is my dad trying to encourage me to find the right mate in my life, right? And he wanted the best for me. And so he gave me this A, B, C, D, E, F kind of criteria on how to find a mate for me. Now here's the thing. What if, what if my father set me down and said this, hey, look, I got the A, B, C, D, E, F on how to find the worst woman for you. A, age, find the girl that is the two times as old as you are, right? B, find somebody who is not the, somebody that you're attracted to. And C, find somebody who does not have any character, like somebody who doesn't have any integrity, right? And then E, and then F, I mean, what if my dad sat me down and gave me that kind of advice, right? That kind of advice that says, hey, here's how to pick somebody who would be really, really probably a bad selection for you. Most of us would sit here, and if I told you that, most of us would sit there and, sit there and say, hey, you know what? That's probably not good advice by your dad. But here's the thing. Hosea, which is where we're going to go, he was asked by God, to be married to a prostitute, right? A prostitute. So here's what we're going to do. Let's go to Hosea chapter 1. Hosea chapter 1, and as you guys are getting there, I'm going to kind of create a little backdrop of what's going on, okay? So during this time when Hosea is being a prophet to the nation of Israel, um, he is, um, he's been ministering there for about 40 years his ministry term in Israel about 40 years. And during that time, Israel is experiencing major, major prosperity. They are experiencing political prosperity, uh, financial prosperity, and militarily, they're doing really, really well. I mean, this is a good time in the history of Israel, the nation of Israel, right? So much so that the nation of Israel, the people of Israel, the people of God have started to be, has started to kind of wander, has started to kind of find other distractions in their life. And they're no longer really obeying God. In fact, they are not obeying him to the point where they are now starting to wander so far away that they're worshiping other gods. Like God is, God is not important to them anymore. And all their prosperity that they are experiencing, they've forgotten him. Like they're able to get on their iPhone and, and, and get on an app and order pizza right to their house. They're able to get on their phone and they're able to also go to Amazon.com and have groceries delivered to them. I mean, this is that kind of a time for them, right? Which is very similar to what we're going through. Right? Everything is at our disposal. Life is good for most of us, and especially here in the United States of America, it's really, really good compared to other countries out there. And when things are going really well, that's the perfect time for us to get distracted for our, from our need and our dependence from God. Because life is good. Like, why? Okay, yeah, I'll go to church. Okay, yeah, I'll pray once in a while. But hey, I got this, and I got this, and then this is going really well, and I've got access to this kind of cash, and I can go travel, and I can do this, and I can do that. And our, 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 our time with God starts to get pushed off to the side. And this is what's happening with Israel. And God sees this, and God is not happy. And so God has this message that Hosea is to communicate to his people. And what is that message? What's the problem that God has with 
uh, with his nation, with his people. Hosea chapter 4, Hosea chapter 4, verse 1 says this. Hear the word of the Lord, O people of Israel. The Lord has brought charges against you. There is no faithfulness, there is no kindness, there is no knowledge of God in your land. Like This is the issue that God has with his people. There is no faithfulness, there is no kindness, and there is no knowledge of me anymore. Like You don't think of me, you don't know me anymore. And the faithfulness that you once had, it's not there. You, you, you wander away from me. Your, your love for me is so fickle. One moment you love me, one moment you want me, and next moment you don't want me anymore. Do you really, really see me as your God? And the kindness, what I have instructed for my people to act as with each other, the kindness is not there. You're being harsh with one another. You're being mean to one another. You're being violent with one another. You're even murdering people. This is not the kind of people that I have raised. And there's no knowledge of me. Even my own priest, they're not teaching you about me. My own priest and my people have started to wander away and want other things other than me. And this is his beef that he has with his people. And this is the message that God has asked Hosea to communicate to his, to his nation. And so here's, here's what happens. Um, this is the message that Hosea is called to speak. But God does something really, really, really strange with Hosea. Okay? And this is what he does. Hosea chapter 1. Hosea chapter 1, verse 2. When the Lord first began to speak to Israel through Hosea, he said to him, Go and marry a prostitute, and that some of their and so that some of her children will be conceived in prostitution. This will illustrate how Israel has acted like a prostitute by turning against the Lord and worshiping other gods. I'm going to stop there for a second. Now, see, here's the thing. This is what God does, right? So God has called uh, Hosea, and Hosea said, "I'm here." Whatever it is that you want me to do, whatever it is that you want me to say, wherever it is that you want me to go, I will go because you are my God and I will serve you to the, to, to the days of my, end of my days. And God says, great. I'm so glad that you said that. Come here, buddy. I've got something else I want you to do for me. Right? He calls up Hosea and he goes, hey, look. I really, really appreciate everything that you, you're doing for me and you being my prophet and you being my mouthpiece. Hey, that's great. I've got one more thing I'm asking of you. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to go out there and I want you to find a prostitute and I want you to marry her. Oh, and by the way, that prostitute that you marry, she's going to cheat on you and she's going to have children that are not yours. Get out there, buddy. Right? Like, I'm trying to put myself in Hosea's shoes. How do you do that? Like, right? The God that I serve, the one that I love, has called me to go out and do something that I don't want to do. A, a prostitute. Now, think about this. This is not just any old Joe. Right? This is a man who has been preaching Day after day after day, year after year after year to his people, right? This would be like Billy Graham coming up and saying, announcing before he ever got married, by the way, I'm getting married to a prostitute. Like that would be shocking. That would be extremely shocking to know that somebody of that stature is going to go off and marry a prostitute. Something that would not be seen very well in that culture in any way, shape, or form. And yet God has called Hosea to do that. How does he do that? How does, how does Hosea, a man with that kind of stature, go off and obey God to do something that is very, very difficult to do? And on top of that, for God to let him know, oh, by the way, when you marry this woman and when she has children, she will have children with other men. She will cheat on you. She will be adulterous. And she will not be faithful to you. 
That's a difficult task, extremely difficult task. And yet, Hosea follows through. Yet, Hosea follows through. How? Because Hosea has an experiential faith with his God. It is not just a reading the Bible kind of intellectual knowledge. He has experienced a relationship with his God. He has been with God day after day after day. He has pushed and pressed into him, and he has heard God speak to him. This is an experiential faith. This is not one of those faiths that is just indirectly experienced by other, through other people. Right? Look, when Sam is up here and he is preaching to you on Sundays, that's his faith. And if you're seated out here in a pew and you are living your own faith through whoever it is that is up here speaking, it's not your own. It's not. It's that person's faith. Look, the example that I always use is this. If I took that chair and I brought it up here and I told you, and you had never, ever experienced or heard about what a chair is, right? And I brought a chair up here and y'all are like, ooh, what is that? What is that object that he has on top of on stage? And I told you, hey guys, this is a chair. And you guys are like, chair? What is a chair? That looks interesting. That looks really cool. Tell me more about this chair. And I sit here and go, okay, so here's the thing. This chair has four legs. And this chair can bear your weight. You can lean back in this chair and be completely fine. The chair will support you. And you guys are sitting there going, oh my gosh, that's a really cool object called a chair. And then here's the thing. I will sit in that chair. And as I sit in that chair, you guys are like, oh my gosh, it's true what he said. That chair does hold him. He can actually lean back and it's actually really comfortable for him. Oh my gosh, that truly is a chair. Right? And then you'll go out of here. And you'll go talk to your friends about a chair. Guys, I saw a chair. It was weird. And this guy, he talked about this chair, and he actually showed me how this chair worked. And you'll go tell other people about this chair, but if you've never sat in that chair, that chair is just an academic understanding of what somebody else has truly experienced for themselves. Does that make sense? A chair is only a chair to you until you have sat in that chair. You cannot speak about that chair the way someone who has actually sat in that chair can. You can have an academic understanding. You can give the blueprints for how that chair works to other people. But if you've never sat in that chair, you can't really share with people the depth of the chair. That's how Hosea is able to do what God has called him to do. He has sat in that chair. He has experienced that chair. And he knows that chair can support me. And so I'll do whatever that chair asks of me. Because that chair can be trusted. How many of us have sat in the experience of Jesus Christ? And how many of us have just heard about Jesus Christ but never really experienced Jesus Christ? There's two big differences. You can teach, you can tell about Jesus But if you can share the experiences of Jesus in your own life, it's so much different. So different. Okay? So let's keep going. So then we see in verse 3, chapter 1. So Hosea married Gomer. Here's the thing. Hosea married Gomer. God never tells Hosea, go pick Gomer. Hosea chooses Gomer. God just said, go marry a prostitute. Hosea chooses Gomer specifically. Okay? Now here's the thing. As we are covering 
or uncovering the story, I need y'all to really see who you and I really are and who Jesus is, right? Jesus is Hosea in this story. Gomer, it's you and me. Like, we're Gomer. Hosea chooses Gomer, just like Jesus chose me and he has chosen you. God says, go find a prostitute and marry a prostitute. Hosea goes out and he chooses Gomer and makes her his wife. Gomer never says, hey, want to get married? Really dig you. Really like you, right? No, Hosea goes after Gomer, okay? And here's the other thing. Um, I'm trying to not put myself in Gomer's situation. What's it like to be Gomer to come up, for a man to come up to you and tell you, I want to marry you, right? Now think about this. Gomer is not, this is not a woman who has been in prostitution just for like a week, right? This has been something that she has been doing for quite some time. So much so that this has become her sense of identity. Her identity, because think about this, as a prostitute in that culture, back then, in, those, in biblical times, you are seen as trash. Like you are seen as somebody that you just want to stay away from. You are seen as somebody who is just dirty. And so when you walk down that street, everybody looks at you with disdain. They look at you and they go, oh my gosh, is that her? Is that Gomer? Oh, Gomer. I've heard about her. Yeah, oh, I've heard. She's not a Christian girl. Just look what she does. And as she walks down the street day by day, the glances and the glares that she must have gotten Right? The shame that she must have felt. The guilt that she must have been carrying just by the glances and the whispers of who she is. So much so, I'm willing to bet Gomer started to adopt. Yeah. I'm a prostitute. I'm dirty. I'm unclean. And there's nothing or no one that would really ever truly want me. I'm jacked up. I'm messed up. And I'm screwed up. I think that. And you know that about me. Right? Like this is probably what Gomer is probably experiencing. And then here comes a man. Right? A man of high stature. Like this is not a normal Joe. This is somebody who is proclaiming God's word. So he's elevated to a certain place in that culture. And here comes this man who has a great, great reputation. And he comes and finds me? You want to marry me? What do you want with me? There are so many women out there that are just perfect for you, but you would want me? And he says, yeah, I want you. I want you, Gomer. But I'm jacked up, messed up, and screwed up, I know. But I'm, I know. But I know. Will you be my wife? Right? And then she eventually says yes. Like, I don't know how long that courtship took. Right? I have no idea. Bible, Scripture doesn't really show us or reveal that to us. I'm willing to bet that probably took a little bit of time because I'm pretty sure Gomer was probably thinking to herself, yeah, this is some sort of a joke. Am I being punked? Are are there cameras here? Right? I'm willing to bet she was probably thinking, this is just a joke. But the more and more and more Hosea pursued, the more and more Hosea showed up on her doorstep, she probably started to think to herself, I think this guy's for real. I think he really does maybe want me. I think maybe, just maybe, he really, truly might want to be with me for the rest of his life. And so she says yes. She says yes. If we continue to read chapter 1, we see this. Just as God had told uh, Hosea, 
um, you will marry her and she will have children that does not belong to you. So as we read the rest of chapter one, we see that that becomes true. The first child that they have together is Hosea's child. And he calls that child Jezreel. And that Jezreel means God plants. Like that's the name, that's the translation for Jezreel. It means God plants. Like this is my people. I planted my people. This is my nation. God planted Israel. Right? The second and the third child is not Hosea's. They're not his. She has multiple affairs within that marriage relationship. Like, right? Just think of this. At what, how difficult must that have been for Hosea to know ahead of time this is what's going to happen, but then to experience that kind of pain. It's one thing to know it, but it's another when you experience that deep sense of rejection from a woman that you want to love, but she does not show you that love back. In fact, she doesn't show it to you at all. She actually shows that love to other men, so much so that she gets pregnant and carries two children that do not belong to Hosea. How difficult must that have been for Hosea? As we finish out chapter 1 and we go into chapter 3, we see that Hosea, Hosea, as much as he has pursued Gomer, Gomer ends up leaving she ends up leaving him. Because the depth of her shame, the depth of her guilt cannot bear the load of being next to this man who continues to love her. She has so much shame and so much guilt inside of her that she feels like, I don't belong here. I don't belong here. And so she leaves him. How many of us have an identity That is not the identity that Christ has given to us. How many of us are still clinging to this identity and this guilt and this shame and this deep sense of uh, pain from our past that the enemy comes and whispers to us, yeah, but, yeah, but this. But did he, did Jesus really forgive you for this? No, you're still this. And you're still that, and you still did this, and you still did that. There's no way God could forgive you for this. That deep sense of guilt and shame can keep believers from really living out a life that was meant to be lived out. And this is what happened to Gomer. Gomer's guilt and shame, her sense of identity, she she goes back to the sex slave industry. She goes back to it because that's all she knew. That's all she's ever known. And why would I think that I could be this when at the end of the day, no matter how you dress me up, I'm still a prostitute. Like, Like I'm a counselor, right? And so one of the things that in my master's program, I had to go do a practicum. Right? And a practicum is when you have to go out there and actually do what you have been taught. Right? You get to go counsel. Right? And I was really, really super nervous about this. But I ended up uh, interviewing at Dallas Life. It's a, it's a homeless shelter in downtown Dallas. And I went there for an interview, and I talked to them, and they were asking me questions. I was asking them some questions. And there was this dialogue that went back and forth. And at the end of the interview, they asked me this question. Sam, uh, is there any questions that you have for us? And I asked them this question. I said, hey, you know what? If I take this job and I, I work here as an intern uh, a counselor with you guys, what's going to be my biggest challenge here? Right? And this was their response. They said to me this, Sam, what we have seen here is this. As we take these homeless people and we bring them into, uh, into uh, the shelter, and we give them brand new clothes. We give them brand new clothes, and then we allow them to go take showers to kind of get themselves clean. Because when they first come in here, they don't smell very good. I mean, because some of them have just urinated on themselves, and some of them have some feces that are still a part of them, and, and they've been out in the, in, in the open and, and in, the, in the weather, and it's just, they're just, they're, there's dirt. 
They're dirty. And so we bring them in and we allow them to go take a nice hot shower. We give them shampoos. We give them soaps. We give them actually a brand new outfit for them to wear. And I said, that's great. That's so awesome that you guys do that. And she said, yeah, but Sam, here's the thing. They go and they'll take that shower. They'll use that shampoo. They'll use the soap. They will use the hot water. But the moment they get done with that, what we have seen is that they will take the clothes that we have given them, the brand new clothes, they will take that and they will tuck it into their backpacks because they don't want to get that dirty. And they'll put back their dirty clothes that they had just taken off and they will put that back on and continue to walk around our shelter. And I'm sitting here thinking, why would they do that? But then I started to look at my own life, right? I started to look at my own life. When Jesus Christ came into my life, he gave me brand new clothes. And I felt clean. But there was a time in my life where the guilt of the things that I have done, the things that I have said, the shame that comes with it, makes me not, not wear that clothes the brand new wineskin. Instead, I go back to the old clothes, the old wineskin, and continue to walk around with this heaviness. Even though I'm saved. Even though I'm saved. It's the guilt and the shame that keeps a believer down. And that's the lies of the enemy. And if we do not know, if we do not understand what our true identity is, we will never really truly live out the life purpose that God has really wanted for us. What's your identity? Because Gomer, Gomer says, I'm, I'm a prostitute. This is what I do. This is what, who I am. And so she leaves Hosea. She leaves him, and then we go into chapter 3. Chapter 3, we see this. Then the Lord said to me, go and love your wife again, even though she commits adultery with another lover. With another lover. This will illustrate that the Lord still loves Israel, even though the people have turned to other gods and love to worship them. Right? There's Hosea again. Right? Hosea's probably going, hey God, this ain't working out. Like, I've done what you asked me to do. She's still cheating. So can we come up with a plan B, maybe? And he goes, Hosea, buddy, come here. I need you to go back out there. I need you to go find your wife. I don't want you to love her again. And he's like, really? Maybe I didn't tell you this clearly, God, but she cheated on me. Two kids, not mine. Right? And she left. I know, right? Go love her again. But God, go love her again. Go love her again, Hosea. Because I'm not done with her. I'm not done with you. And so he goes. He goes. Because he, he's using Hosea as an illustration to his people. Though you have left me, though you have been adulterous to me, though you have cheated on me, I'm not giving up on you. So he says, go, Hosea. Go find your wife and love her again. Here's the thing, and then he says this in verse 3 or 2. So I bought her back with 15 pieces of silver and five bushels of barley and, measure of, and a measure of wine. Right? Do you see this? Do you see this? This is Hosea. God has called him and said, hey, I need you to go love your wife again. I know what she's done, but I need you to go, call, I need you to go out there and I need you to go find her. And when you have found her, I need you to love her again. Right? Now here's Hosea saying, okay, you are good. You have been good to me, and I will do what it is that you have asked me to do. So then here's Hosea. Now I want you to really picture this, right? 
I really need you to picture this. Hosea, a man of great stature, has married a prostitute. That prostitute now has left him, and before she ever left him, she has had multiple affairs, and she's had two kids that do not, that are not Hosea's, right? Now the word is out on the street, right? The word is out on the street about Hosea and his marriage life, right? And God calls him to go find Gomer. Can you imagine this? Can you imagine what it must be like for Hosea to walk down those dark alleys looking for his wife? Right? Can you imagine that? Can you imagine what that must have been like for a man to go in these alleys where normal people would not go, but he went? He went down those dark alleys. He walked down those paths, and he looked for his wife. And he finds her, right? He finds her there, and then he sits there, and he goes, that's my wife. I found Gomer. And then the people that she's now in a sex slave industry with, she, they're like, hey, buddy, I don't really care what you think. I don't care what you call her, what her title is to you. She belongs to us. And if you want her, you're going to have to pay a pretty hefty price. And he's like, wait, whoa, 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 whoa. You don't understand. She's married. She's my wife. I've got the proof. The proof is right here. I've got the certificate. She belongs to me. She's been my wife for years now. In fact, she, we've got kids. She doesn't belong here. And they're like, I don't care what this paper says. I really don't care what this paper says. She belongs to me now. She belongs to us. And if you really want her that badly, 15 pieces of, sh- of silver, five pieces of bushels of barley, and I want a wine. Give me some of that wine. And then we'll consider this whole thing. And then what does Hosea do? He says, okay. Okay. I'll do that. It's your wife. Why would you have to buy your own wife back? Why? And yet Hosea does it. And yet Hosea does that. Now think about this. Now as Hosea is having a conversation with the slave trader, here's Gomer on possibly a stage with other women who is probably shackled and is looking at her husband who has come down and started talking to the slave trader on her behalf. What, what must have that been like, right? For the, for the man that she just cheated on multiple times, for that man to still come back and pursue her, to find her where nobody would tend to go, Nobody would go there. And yet he does that. He does that for her. And then on top of that, the steep price. Because she went back to what she once did and for her to, to get, go free. There's a price that she could never ever pay. But Hosea was able to. Hosea wanted to. And so he pays that price that Gomer was never able to do. That's us. Hosea demonstrated the gospel. That was Jesus. That's our Jesus on the cross. Right? For decades, for centuries, for centuries, many centuries, people of earth People, God's people, was not able to save themselves. There was nothing, nothing you could have ever done, I could have ever done to gain our way into salvation. There was nothing. And so what does God do? God knows that there is a hefty, hefty price for Sam. That there's a hefty price for you. And what does he do? He sends his son. He doesn't send a prophet, a, a, a prophet here. He sends the greatest prophet, his son, the greatest priest, his son, 
The greatest shepherd, his son. The greatest lamb, his son. For you and for me. Our Jesus went down those streets. He went down those paths. Normal people would not go to go find you and you and you and you and you and me. That's what our Jesus did. Do you get that? Our Jesus went places to go seek us out. We never went to go seek him out. He sought us out when we were jacked up, messed up, and screwed up. And he said, I want that one. Who does that? Who does that? Like you're purposely looking for the most screwed up person and saying, I want that guy. I know his name. That's Sam. I know. He's not really where he needs to be, but I still want him. That's why I love my Jesus. That's why I love my Jesus. He sought me out. Now here's the thing, and I'm going to end on this. As we continue to read, verse, chapter 3, verse 5. But afterward, the people will return and devote themselves to the Lord, their God, and to David's descendants, their king. In the last days, they will tremble in awe of the Lord and of his goodness. In those last days, the people of Israel, the people who really worship God, will be, will, they will tremble in awe of the Lord. They will be so much in awe of his love for him that they will worship him. Why? Why would they do that? Let's go back up. Chapter 2, verse 21, 23. At that time, this is what God is saying, at that time, I will plant a crop of Israelites. I will raise them for myself. I will show love to those I called not loved. And to those I called not my people, I will say, now you are my people. And they will reply, you are my God. This verse right here, if you go look at Romans chapter 9, 25, Paul talks about this verse and says, this verse that Hosea was talking about, this thing that God was saying to Hosea, to the nation of Israel back then, that's about the Gentiles. That's about the Gentiles. That's about you and me. We're not a part of the nation of Israel, but we are the Gentiles. And God grafted the Gentiles in with his people and said, these were all my people. This is not just the Jews that are my people, but all of these people will be my people, and these people will know that I love them, and these people will call me, my, them, call me their God. Do you see the amount of love that he has for you and for me? Do you see that? That he would go so far to that depth to not only reconcile his own people, but tend to bring in those are not his people that, have n- that are not uh, worshiping the right people or right God. He brings them in because he loves them. This is the perfect depiction of John chapter 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave, up, gave his only son. For God so recklessly loved the world, the jacked up, the messed up, and the screwed up ones that he sent his son. There's a, I'll finally end on this, um, and I've extended my time, and I I apologize for this. There's a, um, I heard this on, in a sermon once, and I thought it was a really great depiction of law versus grace, right? And this is possibly what um, Gomer was probably possibly going through, and this is possibly what a lot of us are going through in our own lives, that if I just follow the law, if I can just do this and do that, then I'll be okay with God. And we never really truly understand the concept of grace, the concept of grace, that there's nothing that you could ever do that grace was given to you because you couldn't, but grace was freely given to you and to me. 
right? And the story goes like this. A man and woman, they meet, they date, and then they, uh, the guy proposes to her. And we're going to call this guy Law. And he meets this woman. They fall madly in love, and they get married. On the wedding day, she's super excited. The next morning, she wakes up, and she goes, I'm going to cook my brand-new husband a breakfast in bed. So here she is in in the kitchen, scrambling up some eggs, putting the bread in the toaster, squeezing some fresh orange juice, and she's preparing this breakfast in bed. And so she puts everything on this, on this little table, and she, on this platter, and she brings it to her husband, right? He's still laying in bed because it's still early. So here she is. She walks down, and she goes into the bedroom. She puts this plate on his lap, and she says, Good morning, Hunt, sweetheart. I made you breakfast in bed. And he looks at her and he says, this is awesome. This is awesome. Thank you so much. And so here he is taking his first bite of that scrambled eggs. And he takes that bite and he goes, hmm. And then he takes the bread, the toast, he takes a bite of that and he goes, hmm. He takes the orange juice and he takes a sip of that and he goes, hmm, sweetheart, um, can we talk? And she goes, yeah, you're my husband. I'm your wife. Definitely, I want to talk to you. Yeah, tell me, what, what do you think? And he goes, okay, so I'm going to try and put this in a way that you can maybe understand. Um, so the scrambled eggs, a little wet, a little runny, not my cup of tea there. Uh, the toast, a little overcooked. And that orange juice, I don't know if it was really fresh. Not your fault. Not a big deal. Let's try it again. And she goes, of course. Of course, I, I think I, I didn't really cook the scrambled eggs long enough. And, and the bread, you're right, I think I might have set the timer on that a little too long. And the Look, the orange juice, all me. It's all me. I'll, I'll get it right. So here she is. She goes to bed that night, and she's thinking to herself, I've got to get this right the next time. So she wakes up the next morning, and here she is in the, in the kitchen, scrambling up that eggs. Here she is putting that toaster, making sure that the timer is just right, and the fresh squeeze. She goes out to the farmer's market. She pulls the best orange juice, or oranges, and she squeezes that, and she brings it back to her husband, and she goes, good morning. And he goes, Hey, how you doing? She goes, how are you doing? I hope you're going to do well, right? And then here he is, and he goes, this is great. I love this thing. He takes a bite of that scrambled egg. He goes, uh. He takes a bite of the bread. He takes a sip of the orange juice, and he goes, yeah, this is still not right. It's still not right. And this goes on. Day after day after day, week after week after week, month after month, year after year. At some point, what happens to that wife? She gives up. She gives up. She can't please this guy. Because no matter what he, she does, he's going to criticize her. She's tried it a thousand different ways, and yet she can't get it right and these two end up getting divorced so she goes and she stays single for a while and she meets another man and this man basically meets her and says hey i want to marry you and she goes i don't know you're really nice i mean you're really really nice but i don't know I, this marriage thing just doesn't work out very well for, for me it just doesn't end well and he goes I know, but I still love you. And she goes, I'm probably going to kick myself, but okay. I'll say yes. So these two get married. And then here's what happens. That next day after the wedding, she's high anxiety because she remembers what it was like to be married to that first husband, the law. Her new husband is Grace. 
And this is what grace shows up like. So here she is in the kitchen scrambling up that egg. And here she is putting the toast in there. And here she is squeezing that orange juice. And as she's doing all of this, she's possibly even crying, remembering back to that previous marriage and remembering what it was like. And she's probably thinking, this is not going to go well. I don't know why I did this. I don't know why I put myself through this again. And so she takes this platter. She goes in. And she says, good morning. And he goes, good morning. And she goes, I made you breakfast in bed. And, she, and he's like, you did? For me? And she's like, yeah, for you. So she puts that platter on his lap. And he takes a bite of that scrambled eggs. And he goes, huh. And he takes a bite of that bread. And he goes, hmm. And he takes a sip of that orange juice. And here she is going, I've seen this before. I've seen this before. I knew it. And he takes that last sip of that orange juice. And he finishes everything on that plate. And he goes, I loved it absolutely loved it and she goes what but i thought you might have said that the eggs were a little runny and and the and the toast was maybe undercooked this time and and the orange juice i don't even know if it was real orange juices for god's sake you know i don't know and he's like but i loved it because you did this for me i loved it i love you it's not what you do for me It's your love for me. That's grace. Grace gives her what she couldn't find for herself. And a lot of us as believers are married to the law. Not in your marital relationship, in here and here. My hope and my prayer for each and every one of you and for me is that we are constantly reminded of being married to what truly what grace is. And what grace has been given to us. Because our Jesus radically and recklessly loves us. And because we couldn't do anything to fulfill that law in any way, shape, or form, our Jesus did, he has, and now we can be free to really and truly love our Jesus. Do not get shackled down to your old identity that is not who you are god has called you to something greater god has given to you the holy spirit and that holy spirit inside of you gives you great strength and great power live like you are a child of the almighty let us pray Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. Thank you, Father God, for this opportunity for all of us just to be able to be here. Thank you, Father God, for this opportunity for me to be here with the Loft family. I thank you for Sam. I thank you for his church. I thank you for the people. Uh, I pray for anyone here that may not be experiencing the love of God and the grace of God. I pray over anyone here that is confused. I pray that you would uh, find ways to whisper into them, talk to them, reveal what is true about themselves and who they are in you. And I pray that, Father God, that as people leave here, that they would be convicted by what they have heard, that they would push into you, press into you, and want to have a deeper and deeper relationship with you, and that we would stop, stop trying to win favor and to rest in your grace. So we ask all these things in your son's name, Jesus Christ. Amen.